John chapter 3. Take your Bibles, John chapter 3, turn there. It's good to be here tonight, good to have y'all with us, good to have everybody online, beautiful day, it's going to be cold in the, it's going to be cold in the morning. Why is she calling me? Call your mom, find out what she wants. Okay? All right, 1 Corinthians, oh no, that's not where we're going to be. John chapter 3, that's where we're going to be. Um, let's read a few verses. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus is still speaking to Nicodemus. And again, Nicodemus, he already has a religion. He already has, uh, he's a Jew. Why isn't that sufficient? And Jesus comes to him or he goes to Jesus. And uh, the same came to Jesus by night. He went looking for Jesus. And if you remember, I think it's that same Nicodemus that donated his crypt, his burial crypt, which was a cave uh, that he owned. He donated that for Christ and not a bad investment, knowing what he probably guessed that he's only given when he need, 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 need it for three days. And then after that, he can have it back. So uh, Jesus is talking to him about being born again and... Um, Let's pick it up in verse 10, because this is going to match in with what I'm going to say tonight. Uh, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? And the reason why the masters and the people of Israel didn't know God had withheld it from them. I've taught you and I'm going to show you again tonight. I've taught you. I think I know what it's about. I've taught you about how Jesus, you can find Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. He's there everywhere. But nobody knew him by that identity. He was hidden from them in that way for a reason. And uh, even though all the clues were there. And so when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with these two men and they're talking about Jesus, Jesus is with them. Jesus then begins to show them from the Old Testament, every place in the Old Testament where Jesus was. And these guys were eating this up. They invited Jesus to eat with them. And boy, what a supper that would have been. And then all of a sudden he vanished out of their sight. And they were going, that was him. That was it. Didn't we not know that wasn't was we not not burning inside of us when he was talking to us? So they knew they knew it was him. And I believe those guys will be in heaven. Uh, so he said, verse 11, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. And he said, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, and this fits in with what I'm going to speak on tonight. If I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? The Bible was written to us who have never seen heaven, never seen God, never seen Jesus, never been to Jerusalem, haven't, did not see, no, we've not found Noah's Ark yet. We don't know, we wouldn't know Adam from Adam. We don't know him. The Bible tells us all of these things about what happens with angels, what happens up in heaven, what happens behind closed doors, what happens uh, with men who carry secret sins. The Bible tells us all of those things if we'll just awaken to it and read it and believe it. And he, and he says, if I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So we're going to get into that tonight. And no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And now, some have used this verse to say that Elijah and Enoch were not translated to heaven. I don't think he means that. In other words, nobody has gone to heaven to learn all of the heavenly things. No man has gone up to heaven to learn all the heavenly things and then come back down to the earth to share with everybody what it is. That's what I think he means by that. So Jesus himself, who is Lord of heaven knows everything that's going on, came down himself to teach us heavenly things, things that we cannot see with our eyes. 
We know that there must be an end to the universe, to the end of outer space. We know there has to be out there somewhere. But with all the great telescopes that we have up in space, we can't see the end of the universe, much less peer into heaven to see what's going on there. And I would say this, those of you who like to spend time online listening to people talk about things online, like you do me, don't trust anybody who says, I went to heaven and I saw what was up there, or I went to hell and I saw what was down there, or I talked, Jesus came down and talked to me. Don't trust those people. Don't trust those people. I don't care if everything they say matches up with what you know about the Bible. Don't trust them a minute. You have the word of God. You have the written record that you trust. And Jesus has already said, no man hath ascended up to heaven. And I, and I do. I think in the context of this, he means nobody's gone up there to look at all the secrets to come back down to tell us. There was a guy, I told you this recently, there was a guy on Sid Ross at Supernatural on TBN said that he went up to heaven, was in God's library, the library of Jesus, all the things that Jesus said that could not be written in the four Gospels. And he's reading through all these books, and Jesus said he can take two of them down to earth with him. That's a lie. First, that According to that verse, verse 13 is a lie. Bold-faced lie. Violates Scripture. Violates what Jesus said. And um, But the book that he happened to pick up was John chapter 22. There is no John chapter 22. It's another gospel that he was going to come down from heaven with. That's a, I'm telling you, it's a setup. Moses, so he says in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessings upon your word tonight. We ask, Father Lord, that you go with us and open our eyes. Father, give us the foundation, the tools. Give us the lessons, Father, the, the roadmap, the guidebook, the outline. Any teaching aid that you have in your word, show it to us tonight. Father, we want to understand this book. We believe this book is our life. We believe that this book has every answer to every problem and issue in life. We want to search it diligently. It's in our hearts to do so. We want to know the truth. We don't want to be lied to. Many of these people, Lord, have been lied to all their life. And they just, they don't want to be lied to. They, I don't want to lie to them. So, Father, continue to teach me that I can show forth the goodly praises and the awesome things from your word. But Father, bless your word tonight and open our eyes to it, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. And so, I years ago, the, one of the first prophecy conferences I did um, was for Pastor Kelly down at uh, Liberty Faith Bible Church. And I thought I would just put together just some simple things that God God taught me how to understand what was in this Bible. Um, in looking into this pastor in Oklahoma that was murdered. By the way, I found some verses today that just had his name written all over it. And I'm still, folks, that rattled me. That shook me. I was, I've been in a pretty low mood since Sunday over that. Um, and I want you to pray for that church. It is Harmony Free Will Baptist Church in Ada, Oklahoma. And you pray for that church. That God will send them a good, strong, Bible-believing, gospel preacher that will help set that church back on its feet. Uh, if there's God's people in that church, I want them to remain God's people. Amen. But anyway, I, I started, I was looking through my college yearbooks to see if any of the people that I went to school with were from Ada and there was at least one of the teachers that I liked out there was from Ada Oklahoma so I had somewhat of a connection with that area but anyway it reminded me of 
the three years that I spent in Bible college, uh, two and a half years at Hillsdale College in Oklahoma, uh, Moore, Oklahoma, one year or one semester in Free Will Baptist Bible College in Nashville, Tennessee. That was the main denominational Bible college. That's where all the important people in the denomination sent their kids. That's where all the rich families sent their kids. And that's really what it was. It was a sort of a VIP club that I just didn't fit in very well. I could tell that right off the bat. So I didn't, I did not have a good experience out there. But I can tell you that most of the things that I've learned and the tools that I use when I read this Bible, I more than likely did not really get them in Bible college. I remember hearing about typology in college. But I mean, it was just a mention in a, I took a course called Systematic Theology in a book that thick of theological terms was our textbook. And we were learning how to be scholars and theologians, people who study God. And if I remember right, there was a very short thing in there about typology, but it wasn't really, it's almost like they didn't want to put it in there. Well, to me... The study of typology has opened up the word to me in a way that I never had before. And for years, there's been one word that if I were to, if I were to say, if you were to ask me, Pastor, what do you think the most important principle out of the Bible is in understanding the Bible? I would say very quickly, the word as. The word as, A-S, just two letters, one short word. It's like an equal sign. And an equal sign basically shows you that if you've got four eggs in this hand and you have two eggs in this hand and somebody puts two more eggs in this hand, what do you have? This is as that. You've got two plus two here and four here. They equal the same thing. This is that or is as that Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah the only sign that should be given to you is the sign of Jonas as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights so shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth so that word as is God's way of connecting one part of the Bible here a little with another part of the Bible there a little and I'm going to give you some of the scriptures we looked at last Wednesday night we looked at Numbers 21.5, and I'm not going to spend much time here because we've already dealt with it, and, and I've referenced this several times I, I, when I teach on devils and what devils are and what they look like and what they can do. Numbers 21 is one of the places I go to because God released a whole nest of devils upon the Israelites, and they, they were devils. They were devil serpents, spiritual beast serpents, that killed these people. Their poison was not the common poison of a serpent. Um, it was absolute, it was spiritual poison. And those people died, they went to hell. So there had to be a remedy for it. So Jesus takes them this story. Now, does the story from the Old Testament have to be true in order for it to be a proper allegory of Something you find in the New Testament. Does it have to be true? Does Jonas really have to be in the belly of a whale for three days? Or can, can it just be like a, like a fable? We give fables and fake illustrations, invented stories to try to teach something that's true. But the Bible tells us that we do not use cunningly devised fables. We don't, make, we don't have to make stuff up. If you want a neat if you want to find neat explanations, they're in the Bible. And I had the idea the other day of starting to write down all of the supernatural things that are in the Bible. Like, for instance, when, when uh, Peter and, uh, and John were in jail, when Peter was in jail, I think it was, and how he was locked up in shackles, all the jail cells locked, all of a sudden an angel appeared. said, Peter, stand up. Peter stands up and immediately the shackles fell off of him. That angel has the ability to manipulate things in this world in a way that we don't know how to do. How is it that those shackles fell off of his hands? And then all of a sudden, the locked door opened up. How does that happen? 
That angel had power over that locked iron door. That's a miracle. That's something supernatural. And then you had these Roman guards. They were all asleep. Roman guards don't go to sleep. If a Roman guard is caught going to sleep, more than likely he will fall on his own sword because he's going to be executed. That's how it was back then. It was very brutal back then. All these guards were asleep. The jail cells were open. All the shackles fell off. And you got one, one jailer crying, saying, Man, I'm going I'm to get killed. You're going to get me in trouble. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of all of it. And I guess if you're the guy and you saw all that happen, you'd say, man, I'd like to know who this God is. Okay? Supernatural things happening. And if we, but it is important that the story that you read, that you actually believe that it happened. One of the things I learned in my systematic theology class was from a German Lutheran scholar. And the, they're the German Lutheran scholars... And those guys were nuts. I can't, I, his name may have been Karl Barth. But here's what he said. Here was his idea about the gospel and Jesus Christ and theology. It's not important that Jesus died for our sins. It's important that we believe that Jesus died for our sins. Now, is that true? No. If Jesus didn't actually die for our sins... It's like saying Santa Claus is my savior. And I believe that. But there is no Santa Claus. The Pentagon and NASA has not spent 30 million dollars researching and looking for Santa Claus. They don't do it. And that's what that theologian came up with. It's not important that Jesus died for our sins. It's important that we believe he died for our sins. But then you're believing in something that is a total lie. And that makes you no different than any other person on the planet, dead or alive. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and so Jesus draws our attention to that. There is a story there, and we see the typology of it. When we go and look in Numbers 21... Uh, in fact, look up on the screen or open your Bible to Numbers 21 and tell me where Jesus is in this text. Numbers 21, 5 through 9. Tell me where Jesus is here. He's here. In a type, an allegory, a shadow, a figure, a symbol. He's here. Where is he in this text? Huh? You, yeah, you could say that. You could say that. So that, that answer is not technically wrong. It's not the one I was looking for, but it's not technically wrong. Nope. Well, that's true. You're correct on that one too. In relation to John 3, 14 and 15, where is Jesus in Numbers 21? Huh? The serpent. The serpent. The serpent on the pole that Moses made is where Jesus is in this particular foreshadow, type, allegory, example, symbol, figure. That's what he said. As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He himself said it out of his own mouth. And I explained the other day, he's not the devil, but what he did was he took the enemies that were against us and nailed them to his cross. And so the serpent is the one who tempted mankind, brought sin into the world. So the serpent represents sin. He represents the power of death because what's in his mouth is poison. It kills everybody. So it represents Satan. But Christ then took his enemies, making a show of them and killing them on his cross when they killed him. That's where Jesus is. Okay. Now. Uh, let's see here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. So you can call tonight's lesson typology, allegory, and Bible symbolism. This is the tool now. This is one of the tools that you use when you're reading your Bible. And so many people 
uh, have caught on to this. I got a phone call from a guy today, and it was a four-minute phone call. And he showed me, he got, he was so excited, he said, Pastor, he said, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but, and he told me a word that he had found in the scripture and told me how many times it was there and how many chapters it was there and, and how many, uh, so on. And he just gave me all the statistics. I'm looking it up. He's dead on. And I'd never knew that before. And I said, man, you bless my heart with this. Thank you for that. He gets it. He gets it. He's looking for numbers as typology and allegory and symbolism. He understands that numbers have a meaning to them in the Bible. And God will always define the meaning of it. So in 1 Corinthians 10, here's what Paul tells us. And he gives us this whole thing here to show us basically what my systematic theology book, almost like they wanted to hide it and cover it up. Paul said, now I beseech, uh, I must, no. I'm in 2 Corinthians. I'll look at my notes. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the sp same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And what he's saying now to me tells me that how God dealt with Israel is in fact no different on how he will deal with us. And some people cannot get that in their minds. To them, well, that, anything in the Old Testament, that doesn't apply to us. That's not us. That's not for us. Paul said it was. Paul said it was. they were baptized like we're baptized. They ate the same spiritual meat as they ate manna, we eat manna. They drink of the rock that is Christ. We drink of the rock that is Christ. Just because they didn't know it and we do, that doesn't make a difference. They were all, they were the same as us were. And he's going to use this to tell you how God dealt with them is exactly how he's going to deal with us. So he says, um, verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. And ask yourself the question, in 2021, in, in tomorrow's April 1st, 2021, at this modern time, are there churches and church members that God is not well pleased with? Absolutely. At times, it was me. At times, it was you. He was not well pleased with you. And you should take the typological, symbolic, allegorical figure warnings that God gave that if God did it to those people, who are you? Are you anything better than they are that God has to treat you different? The answer is no. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our, and underline that word examples. Examples. That has the word sample in it. Costco's cut it out. Everybody's cut it out. You can't go to Costco anymore and get free samples. I know it. We're starving to death now when we go in there. Because of COVID, you can't get free. And I, the sample worked. If I liked it, I would go, man, I want that. It does work. Now, these things were our examples to the intent. We should not lust after evil things. And look, what's the next word? As. As they also lusted. So God says, go back and look, go back and read those stories. You want to know how God will deal with you for lusting after evil things? Go back and look at how Israel lusted after evil things. And if God treated them a certain way and God doesn't treat you the same way, he's not a very fair God, is he? Some even say that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as God of the New Testament. That's a lie too. Same, same God, yesterday, today, forever. Doesn't matter. They were... Uh, uh, these things were examples who intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse 7, neither be idolaters. And the New Testament then will help us because we can, we can beat our chest and say, thank, bless God, we don't have any statues of Mary in here. But are we not idolaters when we covet? That's what Paul said. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither, verse 8, 
Let us commit fornication as some of them, as they did. Do people commit fornication now? Did they commit fornication back in Moses' day? Yes. How did God deal with the people who committed fornication? He slaughtered them. He killed them. There was a, a guy in the Bible, when they were wandering in the wilderness, that had grabbed him a woman from somebody, I can't remember, she, I can't remember who she was, Canaanite woman or something like that, and snuck her into the camp. She was a non-Jewish woman and snuck her into the camp and he was in there laying with this woman and it was told to Moses and a guy went in there and took a spear and went through both of them. Killed them both instantly. You ask yourself, is that worth it? I have to... I have to throw in this example of this pastor got shot and killed by his wife, by his lover. His sins found him out. Shot while he was asleep in his own bed with his own gun. God was not well pleased. And the same God that did that to that old boy in the old in the Old Testament, same God. God will God will do that. If God has spared you, you ought to just spend a half a day one day just praising God for sparing your life. Neither verse nine. Oh, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Twenty three thousand people died in one day over fornication. Neither let us tempt Christ as, there it is again, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That's Numbers 21. You see, they were tempting God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, you should not ever have a doctrine or a philosophy or an idea of God that God will let you sin all you want to, but he still has to let you go to heaven. You are tempting God. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in Samples. We have examples and in samples. Look at people's lives. In the news every now and then. You can go to some of these news apps and they'll show you um, uh, police booking photos. When they book somebody into jail, they'll show you their mugshot. And every now and then, they'll, the news will release a picture of some pretty young lady. Her first arrest for drugs and then 15 pictures later in just five years time, the meth has absolutely destroyed her beauty, rotted her face, rotted her features, rotted her teeth. It has literally destroyed her. And you look at that and say, why does people do that to themselves? And we're supposed to look at that and say, I don't I don't want that. I don't want that life. I don't want to be that way. Uh, they are now all these things happen to them for in samples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are are come. So he uses examples and in samples. And he says the word as here about a half a dozen times. This is as that when you learn this, then you can understand that. Uh, so look up there on the screen, pay attention to, and I made just a short list. Men in the Bible, they will often either represent Christ or Antichrist. So a man who represents Christ, David, David is a type of Moses. You said Moses while well, ago is a type of Christ. Um, Hezekiah, Josiah, 
type of Christ. David, a type of Christ. Types of Antichrist, Goliath, Nimrod, Baal, um, Ahab. These are types of Antichrist. Uh, Absalom is the face of a man, the hair of a woman. Study things like that. They're in there for the, in the Bible to teach you these things. Women. I did a, I ended up feeling a little bit better yesterday, so I had some time and I recorded a Pastor Mike Online live broadcast and I mentioned Babylon. And everybody's got an opinion about what Babylon is. Well, Babylon's the Vatican. No, Babylon is the United States. No, Babylon is New York City. No, Babylon is Las Vegas. Babylon is Jerusalem. And it's, and you know, they would say Babylon's a city. Well, I believe that. But in the Bible, in Bible terminology, a city was a kingdom. A city was a nation state in it, in and of itself. And cities, there are two type, typological cities. There's Jerusalem above and Babylon below. And they're both characterized as women. Jerusalem above, which is free, is the mother of us all. So any woman in the Bible who's a mother, Sarah was the mother, Eve, the mother of all living. Rachel, Leah, these are mothers. Um, Hannah became a mother. Uh, Israel, as a female, is going to bring forth. So women will represent either a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, a, a church upon whom the grace of God is on, the mercy of God, God has purified this woman, or she's going to represent Babylon, a harlot woman, an evil woman, a strange woman, a wicked woman, with a Marijuana joint in one hand, martini glass in the other. Okay? She's, she's a drug addict. She's an alcoholic. She makes other people drunk. She sells drugs. She puts drugs. That's the spirit behind her. Women in the Bible. You, you have Sarah. You have Eve. You have, uh, you have, uh, Rachel. You have, uh, Hannah. I mentioned these. Uh, you have the Shunammite woman. You have Elizabeth. You have Mary. You have very glorious women in the Bible, pure women, women who just want to serve God. Then you have strange women, Jezebel, um, Delilah, Herodias. These are all harlot women. And so they represent and are types of churches, nations. I, I've got here written down cities, which are kingdoms. They're either going to represent heaven or hell. Jerusalem actually in different times represents both because Jerusalem on the earth represents Jerusalem above, which is free. But then we find in the book of Revelation that um, that great city, which is Sodom and Egypt, is Jerusalem in Revelation. What is that? Revelation 11, I think. So Jerusalem it was at one time the holy city. Now she's the harlot city. She has fallen. Jezebel fell. Did she not? Okay. Th things like that. Things that fall. Things that rise up. Um, offices in the Bible. A king. A king is only going to, either going to be king of kings, Jesus Christ, or a king of kings like Nebuchadnezzar. A pseudo-Christ, a false Christ. Kings, prophets. There are prophets of God, holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and then there are false prophets. And they represent times that we're in right now. Listening to any preacher, whether it's on TV, with satellite, whether it's the internet, whether it's the radio, or you read their books, they are either going to faithfully represent what is in this book, or if not, they are a false prophet. And they intend to lure you away. Learn everything you can about false prophets in the Bible. And you won't be fooled by none of these idiots. Prophet, priest. There are good priests and bad priests in the Bible. Uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, offered strange fire before God. God killed them. God killed them both. Uh, captains. Jesus is the captain of the host. 
Uh, but we know that that beast is going to lead the armies of the world at the Battle of Armageddon. Apostles. There is Christ, the chief apostle. There are false apostles. Shepherds. There is the good shepherd, Jesus. There is the idle shepherd. Counselors. Jesus is the faithful counselor. Or there are wicked counselors. There is a wicked counselor. Warriors, etc. You just go on and on. Any office in the Bible. It's either, depending on the character of the person holding that office, you're either learning something about Christ and his nature and his character, how he does things, or you're learning something about the Antichrist. He may be a foolish person. Then, animals. Animals are all through the Bible. And here's what I've found out. Animals will represent heavenly creatures. Earthly animals. There's a place in the Bible, and I don't have the verse in front of me, but it, it paraphrases in my mind something like this. Learn about the animals because they'll teach you about how God's ways are. I mean, every animal has its own nature, has its own character, has its own uh, instincts that it does. Foxes have holes and birds have nests. Birds don't have holes and foxes don't have nests. Learn where they live. Learn how they, when they come out. Learn things about them. You're going to see lambs. Jesus is a lamb. But remember the false prophet has two horns like a lamb. So he's looking as if he's Jesus. But he speaks as a dragon. He's not Jesus. Goats. When Jesus separated the sheep. From the goats, we understand now, goats represent a different thing than sheep do. Lions, and you can have the lion of the tribe of Judah, or you can have Satan, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Dragons, study dragons in the Bible. Fowls of the air, in the parable of the seed and the sower, the fowls of the air are mentioned that they swoop down and they pick up the seed that's by the wayside. But when Jesus gives the Teaching of it tells us what the fowls represent. He says Satan or the wicked one or the devil. So because they have wings and we know that there are angels who have wings, anything that has wings in the anything that has wings on this earth is going to be a characteristic of an angel of some kind, good or bad. When you look at the list of the clean birds that they could eat and the unclean birds they couldn't eat, what generally was the difference? It was the, their diet. Usually the clean birds they could eat ate seeds and grains. Unclean animals were them nasty vultures and crows that are sitting out picking guts off of skunks on the side of the road. And think, boy, this is good. Well, we hate to fly. Here comes a car. I ain't flying away from that one. I got me a good skunk here. We wouldn't touch that with it. I wouldn't touch that with Bear Grylls pole. Amen. He ate a skunk on his TV show one time and squeezed water out of elephant dung and drank it. Nah. Nah. Uh, dogs. Dogs in the Bible. Study dogs. Clean and unclean animals. Colors. What does white represent? What does white represent? Holiness, pure, cleanliness. What does red represent? Scarlet, harlot. Though your sins be as... So it represents sin. It was the Red Sea that they passed through, wasn't it? What buried Pharaoh? The Red Sea. Okay? Colors in the Bible. Red, blue, gold, purple, green... Black, white, those things matter. Numbers, could teach on numbers all day. Objects, a temple. Temple's going to be the dwelling place of God and it's going to be a body. It's going to be a family, a Christian home, a Christian church, a Christian individual, a stone, just a rock. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Stones, you have the stone cut out without hands. That's Christ, because no man's hands carved out Jesus and made him who he was. So Jesus was not 
the God made by the hands of men. And that's what they accuse Paul of preaching. He's preaching that they are not gods who are made by hands. Paul's going, guilty. I'm telling you, that's exactly right. They're not gods. If you had to make them with your hands, what kind of God are they? And people just don't get that in their mind. They'll bow to them every single time. So stones, swords in the Bible. Jesus' words are sharper than any two-edged sword. He has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, but so does the strange woman. Her words will cut as a sharp two-edged sword. Arrows in the Bible. Things that sting in the Bible. Sting of death is sin. What, what things sting in the Bible? Thorns, pricks, wasps, bees, uh, scorpions, nails. Okay? These all sting. They, go, they sting in a person. They represent death. Uh, the wind, the air rep will represent a spirit of some kind. The sun, moon, the stars, the planets. They always represent angelic entities. Always, good or bad, they will always represent that. Wheels. A simple wheel in the Bible. In Ezekiel 1, we have wheels. Very interesting, curious wheels in Ezekiel 1. That do weird things. Chariots. Gold. Bowls. It's, I mean, any kind of object. So here is Christ as a, in, in this one place in Numbers 21. I really wasn't thinking of it, but all you guys were right. Here's Moses as Christ. Here's the manna as Christ. And now here's the serpent on the pole as Christ. The lamb that was killed was Christ. The high priest that killed him was Christ. God will provide himself a lamb. So Christ was multiple things there on Calvary. He was the sacrifice. He was the sacrificer. The high priest. He was all of these things. So if you just, re as reading your Bible, maybe make a list of some of these things I've shared with you. You can come up with your own list. As you're reading, make your own list. Have a little notebook. And write down types. And if you don't understand it one day, just put a question mark by it. I don't, know, I don't quite get how this is Christ or if this is Antichrist or what. But I guarantee you one day, you're going to read something you're going, I know what it is. And you'll be able to write it down in your notes. You learned something that day. And God showed you something from a story that we're told doesn't really have any meaning anymore because these are things that have already happened. Why should we bother to read them? No, these are things that are showing us how what things are going to happen in the days that are ahead of us. Guarantee you 100%. So Hebrews 9, turn there. I want to make the Bible interesting to you. I don't, you know, I struggled reading the Bible because it didn't interest me. I didn't know then what I know now. What I know now, I know that if I'm going to read something, I'm going to read a story. There's something in there for me to learn. God may teach it to me that day, that month, next year, 10 years from now. There's things that I asked God 20 years ago. He has not yet quite answered. But I'm going to wait. And I'm going to keep searching. I'm going to keep looking. So, and, and number one, you do have to believe what you read. Because if you don't believe what you read, then you'll try to change what you read. And I've done that before. It doesn't work. Okay? So leave the book alone as you found it. And it'll teach you these things. And then it will be interesting to you. You'll, you'll see things and you'll get goosebumps. And then every now and then you'll cry a little bit. Because you'll say, God, I'm a horrible person. Why'd you show me that? That was a treasure. Why'd you show me that? He says, I, because I love you. And you asked me to. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went in, went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself 
and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now let me stop right here. I'd learned something the last few weeks that I never really knew before. In studying the Catholic Mass, I found out that they refer to it as the unbloody sacrifice. Now, because I know the Bible, and I know a little bit about the law, and I know Christ, I know what His blood means, and how important His blood is in salvation. Is it possible to have an unbloody sacrifice for sins? The answer is no. Without the blood, there is no remission of sins. Not possible. So just that little bit of reading that I, when I'm reading this, this is an unbloody sacrifice that's going to save you from your sins. I'm going, that's not possible. That's a lie. And I'm telling you, Anybody who's a Roman Catholic who would get a hold of just some of these very simple things, they would be able to see the big gaping holes in their doctrine and how it doesn't match what God said. Not even close. So now verse 9. So he's talking about Moses and the tabernacle. In verse 9 he uses the word figure, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances. The word carnal here means of the flesh. What good does it do to wash the flesh, the outside, if the inside is unclean? It's like... Uh, it's like Matthew, if, if Hunter brought you a bowl and said, daddy, pour me some cereal and he was wiping the outside of it, the inside of it had dried milk, rice krispies and mold from three days ago when he ate out of that bowl. Daddy, pour me some cereal. Uh, son, that bowl's not clean, but I watched it. See, see daddy. Right? Can you see Hunter doing this? I can. So, you tell him, son, it doesn't do any good to wash the outside of the bowl. It's got, the inside of the bowl has got to be clean. And the Jews never understood that. That's what the whole book of Matthew was all about. Jesus was telling them, what you guys have got is only on the outside. I'm here to show you that your religion is supposed to be on the inside. So it, it was only about carnal washings and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. God was going to reform his people and his covenant. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, obtained eternal redemption for us. So then this gets now into the neighborhood of the Hebrew roots people who are telling us that the shadow of salvation is better than the thing that provided the salvation. Talking to my shadow is a lot better than talking to me. Or me offering to you something and you taking it from my shadow, which basically you have now nothing. That's what the Hebrew roots and the Jews are still doing. They're still following the shadow, but not the one who's creating the shadow. Jesus. So then Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, verse 17, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Where does that phrase come from? John three sixteen, his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. We use figures of speech, don't we? 
I ought to slap you silly. Let's, I'm not really going to hit you until you are losing consciousness. It's just a figure of speech. That's what this is. The figures are there in the Bible, but they're not the real things. The real things are yet to come. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So that, now we get back to what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. And there's more than just one thing from the days of Noah. You look in the days of Noah, you've got the ark, you've got the water, where the water came from, you've got the animals, the numbers of the animals going on, you've got the giants to deal with, sons of God, daughters of men. But there's a ton of stuff. In the story of Noah, that I believe God is telling us these things are going to happen once again. As it happened then. And he, Jesus himself said, for in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And the only people you see marrying and giving in marriage in the days of Noah was the sons of God and the daughters of men. What does that tell you? It's going to happen again. So he said the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight. There's a number. Why eight? Souls were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to even baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's telling you that what happened in the days of Noah, the waters of Noah, was baptism. Noah and his family were baptized. They went through the water. Israel was baptized when they went through the Red Sea. So you and I were baptized. That water there is only a shadow of the real water that washes not just our skin and our clothes, but it washes our conscience. Do any of us here have things that are on our conscience that we wish we'd never done? Amen? But what do we know now? God's forgiven them. And he will not hold us accountable for them ever again. And I know that because the water of the word has washed even my conscience. And baptismal water, especially baptizing a baby. Babies don't have any conscience. Okay? Okay? They'll pee in the baptistry. They do all the time. They don't care. Babies don't think that way. You can't baptize babies and think they're going to go to heaven now. It doesn't work. The water of the word of God will wash their conscience away. Galatians 4. I'm almost done. Galatians 4, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. See, there's a number there. And anytime you have two in the Bible, God's going to show you a contrast between the two. Like with what James said. Can a fountain put out sweet water and bitter? No. You go down to hot, you mentioned, somebody mentioned hot springs the other day. Hot springs, Arkansas. You go to hot springs, Arkansas. And they have some of the coldest spring water, mineral water, and it tastes so good coming right up out of the ground. They got, what, they got places there you just fill all the jugs you want. And it is ice cold and you can taste those sweet minerals in there. Oh, it's so good. But then they've got, just two blocks down the road, the hottest water in the world coming up out of the ground. It's got a different taste to it. It's got a little sulfur in it. You can smell it. Okay, but the same fountain does not put out sweet and bitter water. Those are contrast. And with the two, Hagar and Sarah, Ishmael and Isaac, you have a contrast. They're different. So he said, but um, he that was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by a promise, which things are an allegory. Well, that word allegory, there are, Writers who write books that write allegories. They write about things that have happened or they write about people they know, but they use somebody standing in their place. They give them a fictitious title of 
Reg Kelly put me in his book that he wrote. He told me, he said, Mike, you're in it. Really? What Reg knows of me, he used me as an allegory in his book, a, a minister. And I don't remember how all he did it, but what Reg knows about me, he made up a character, different name, but that guy in that book, that's me. Okay? Uh, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. But we, brethren, or now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Notice the word he used in verse 29. But as, as Hagar and Ishmael persecuted Sarah and Isaac, so do the people who are in bondage. They're going to kill us. They are going to kill us. During the dark ages, who killed Christians? Was it atheists? Who was it? The Catholic Church. They killed all the Baptists, all the Calvinists, the Huguenots, whoever they could find. Whatever sect of Christianity that would not give allegiance to the Pope. Because all, all of those groups said the Pope is the Antichrist. The Catholic Church killed them. And that tells you now that during that time, who was Hagar and Ishmael? The harlot church, Rome. And who was Sarah and Isaac? Those early Anabaptists. Those early people of the Reformation. They were the children of promise. And now we're living in a day where we have governors and governments that hate true Bible Christianity. And they will seek to kill us. Okay? And you have two stories in the Bible about that. Those who died in faith, choosing rather to die than to turn their back on Christ. Or those whom God spared from death. Either way, God's hand's in it. Amen? Take that now. And go back to your Bible and start reading. Study. Study it. Just pick a story in the Bible and then try to start figuring out who all the players are. You could start with 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath. That's an easy one. But I guarantee as you start writing down why Goliath is the beast, why is David Jesus, verses will start coming into your head. And now you have the keys to basically unlock anything in the Bible that you want to understand. And God will help you do it. Amen? And that's what I want. I don't want it just for me. I want it for everybody. And God bless you people who are studying your Bible. Amen?